Okay, so you got, uh, we're back on schedule now. We got um, Wilbur due tonight at 7, Wednesday at 7, and then you got written homework due Thursday, recitation. I posted that yesterday. Um, and I think, so, and then I think we're going to start, attendance is down a little bit in recitation, so we're going to start having quizzes in recitation. So the first quiz will be this Thursday, and it'll, it'll be on the written homework. So... Something from the written homework, you have a, like a 10 minute quiz at the beginning that relates to the written homework, okay? All right, so just want to recap from last time. We were, uh, we were um, bringing the ring, you know, Sam and, Sam and Frodo were bringing the ring to um, the Flyers of Mordor. Um, and they needed to make this journey here from this point to this point to throw the ring in the eternal fire. And we said Sam was going to carry Frodo on this path, and we wanted to find out how much work he was going to do to do that. Could, could he make it? Could, could they make it, our heroes, right? So did Sam have enough, have enough in him to do that amount of work? So the first thing we said was, how in the world are we going to parameterize this path in order to find that amount of, uh, that line integral from point A to point B? What was the first thing we did? Yes, and why could we do that? So why could we also just do the work from straight from point A to point B, a straight line, like through the air, like they're flying? Yeah, because this was in a, in a conservative vector field, right? It was a gradient field, a gravity field was a gradient field. And so, and because of that, we have path independence, right? We have path independence. And so every, every path from point A to point B through this field would have, have the same amount of work. So that made things a lot easier, right? So we calculated the line integral from there to there. But then we said, from physics, we remember that the amount of work that we do, so that, here's that line integral. We did that line integral over here on the right for the straight line. And then we said, from physics, that amount of work is the same as the change in potential energy. So we, we calculated the change in potential energy, and we got the exact same amount of work, 712.95 kilojoules. Then we recognized, wait a sec, that potential energy function, that was just the potential function for this gradient field. right? We knew this was a gradient field. We found that we had earlier found a potential function. We said, hold on a sec. That potential energy is the same as the as the potential function. And that's, in fact, this context of work and, uh, and energy is the reason we call this, this the potential function, because if we're calculating the work, that's actually the potential energy function. And from that, we said, so that line integral then, yes, it's the difference of potential energy, but it's therefore it's the difference of the potential function, right? Because this is potential energy final minus potential energy initial. And that, we recognized, was just like our fundamental theorem from Calc 1. But this is the fundamental theorem of line intervals, right? Right? Where this, this vector field is something of the derivative of little f, right? It's like, it's like a rate of change function. That gradient field is expressing the rate of change of our of our uh, surface F, or of our, sorry, I should say, of our, uh, <coughs> this is in the potential function, right? Okay, so that's where we left off. So that all being said, I'm going to have an example here. Let's look at this. So I'm back here. This is my uh, field. 
This is my vector field. One comma y. And I want to find, say this is uh, C1. I want to find the line integral C1, which is from A to B. of f dot dr. I'm also showing the unit circle, uh, a path along the unit circle from A to B. This is actually point uh, 0, 1 and 1, 0. So I want to, I think I told you what the value was, but now I'm going to actually, and I want to actually calculate it. I want to calculate this value. How am I going to do it? Can you see the fundamental theorem? Can I use the fundamental theorem of line integrals? Why can't I? Do I have a conservative field? Yeah. If I have a conservative field, it's a gradient field, it means that there is some function f such that f is what? The gradient of f. And I can use that little f, what we call the potential function. And if we find the difference in potential, that will be the same as the line integral along C1. So good. That, that, so I was thinking maybe someone would say, oh, let's just do the straight line path because that's the easiest path. And that's true. You could do that. So you could, you could come up with, you know, the, what's the line? Uh, this is a 1 minus x. And you could actually calculate this line integral along 1 minus x be a lot easier than this, whatever this uh, curve is for C1. And that'll do it. But the best thing to do would be to actually find the potential function and find the difference in potential. OK, so let's do it. So what is f then? So th this is what? This is f kind of like at b minus f at a. All right, and so we need f. So what is f x y? So we get one view of it by looking at this as the partial derivative with respect to x, right? So if f of x is equal to one, our first view of f is x plus some function of y plus some constant, and then the partial derivative of y being y gives us a second view of f, right? These are not two different functions that we're going to like add together, right? They're the same function. We get two different perspectives, one from each of the partial derivatives, all right? So this one is? Yeah, we have 1 half y squared plus some function of x plus a constant. So then the question is, if this is a gradient field, we should be able to resolve these as the same function, right? These are just two perspectives on the same function. We're not adding them together. They need to be the same function. Can they be the same function? Yeah. Sure. Here x and this h of x can, are a match. Here y and this g of y are a match. We're good, right? So f is x plus 1 half y squared plus any constant. And so we can use that now to calculate. So we've got that. So this is our function is x plus 1 half y squared plus any constant. And so then the line integral is equal to what we do. Right. That's right. So now we're going to this let's say we can use the potential function evaluate at the final point minus the initial point. So at the final point, what do we got? 1 plus 0 plus c. Is that f of b? Minus 
one half plus zero plus c equals I think last time we said it's a small positive value. So if we were to do out the line integral the long way, we ought to get also ought to get one half. Okay, so let me show you then what's really happening here. What what kind of our potential function is what kind of function in R3? It's a surface, right? So how is it that the, the difference of these values, z values on the surface, is the same as the, the accumulation through the of that along that path in the in the um, vector field? So this is the most important part. So you definitely don't want to be on your, your smartphone for this. Okay. So how is it? How is it that the difference of z values, right? This is just a, these are just z values of the surface. The difference of z values is the same as the accumulation along the path. Anyone wants to take a stab at that? So it goes back to what this is right here. What is our vector field? What is that thing? Gradient field. And what is a gradient field? Or gradient vectors, what are those? No, but what are gradient field vectors? What are vector what are gradient vectors? Okay. The direction of yeah, so the direction of a gradient vector is the direction of greatest change. And the magnitude of the gradient vector is? Right. And so that's what I want. The magnitude of the rate of change is like if you're expressing that as a derivative, would be like, you know what, like dy dx. What is it? Change in what? If it's the magnitude of greatest rate of change, it's the change in what per change in what? dz, right? Per? horizontal change right so I'm gonna call that like this this is not I made I just made that up but it's per so the direction of the gradient right so it's it's the change in Z per direction of the gradient and we're gonna dot that with what a little bit of the direction of the curve so what will that give us so the dot product will then be as much as they're in the same direction. So as much of this as in the direction of the curve. But what will that calculate then? A little, right? A little change in z. Right? It'll be a little change in z in the direction of the curve. So that's the rate of change. And then what are we going to do? We're going to accumulate all those little changes in z. And so we'll get... The whole change in z, right? We'll get the whole change in z starting from point A to point B, which is what this is. Final value of z minus initial value of z will be the accumulation of all the little changes in z along the path. Pretty cool. It's better than you think. Watch. if that works. So I'm going to make my constant 1. Is that okay? Here's our potential function, right? x plus y squared over 2 plus 1. So as we walk this path, we can, we can get the change of potential energy in two ways. We can accumulate little changes of potential energy by looking at the vectors in R3, and those vectors are going to give us what, the amount of change in Z for a little change along the path. Or, we can just take what? Final Z minus initial Z. And those will give us the, give us the exact same thing. 
I should show those down in the z-axis, z-point, x-y-point. There we go. So the accumulation of changes in Z given by the gradient vectors, right? This gradient is the rate of change of Z with respect to horizontal. Or just take what? Well, just take the height of that minus the height of that. So that's kind of what's happening with the with the fundamental theorem. All right, any questions on that? So your homework gives you lots of variations on that. If you need, if you got a question on the homework, catch me in off stars today or after class. But lots of variations on using the fundamental theorem to to uh, solve line integrals if you have a conservative field. So let's just do a summary here. So we've learned lots of things about conservative fields. And so there's a series of statements here, and they're all mathematically equivalent. If any one of them is true, then the rest are true. And the first is F is a conservative vector field. So what's one? Can you tell me things? I think there's like four or five more things that we said are equivalent to F being a conservative field. What? Can you think of one? Yeah. What's that? Path independence, right? So given any two points in the field, every path from... A to B uh, will give you the same line integral value. What else? Path independence. What else? It's a gradient field. There is some there's some multivariable function that has F as its gradient. What else? Yeah. Closed Right. So every every closed loop in a conservative field will give zero. Will give a zero uh, circulation line integral. Right. That's three. What else? What have we talked about most of class today? Okay. The fundamental theorem holds, right? The fundamental theorem of line integrals will hold in a conservative vector field. There's one more we learned last time. Okay, so there, there's F as a gradient field. F has a potential function such that the gradient of F is our capital F. Thoreau's theorem. This is the one that you guys didn't think of. If F is PQ, then the, the parcel of P with respect to Y equals the parcel of Q with respect to X. That's that relationship of second, second, um, second derivatives. Right? So it's P would be like FX, and Q would be like FY. So then fxy would be fyx. All right, and the rest you got. Every closed, every circulation integral for every closed loop in C equals to zero. The conservation of energy, that's, that's where conservative comes from, right? Conservation of energy along every closed loop. Path independence. For any two points A and B and F, the line integral is constant. Here's the key point to this. For path independence, you have to have a fixed starting point and a fixed ending point. Path independence doesn't mean that every path in the integral has every path in the field has the same line integral. It's given a starting point and an ending point that doesn't change. Every path from A to B is the same line integral. Change the change the start and ending point, it's gonna be a different value okay, for the line integral. And then the fundamental theorem holds. If C is a path from A to B then the line integral is the difference in the potential function. All right, so let's talk about, let's move on to something called Green's theorem. Any questions on conservative vector fields? Uh, 
first place though. Okay. Okay, Greenstorm. Okay, so make sure your brain is on. You're not just copying down words, okay? Suppose that C is a simple closed curve, and that just means it doesn't cross itself, and it, it makes a loop, goes back to where it started, okay? And then that will create a, a region D. And it's oriented so that so that the region is on the left as we traverse the curve. So we can walk it two ways. We can walk around two ways. Um, we, we're going to call positive orientation the way that if you walked around, D would be to your left. So if we just think of something simple like the unit circle, would that be clockwise or counterclockwise along the unit circle? Counterclockwise would be the positive orientation because as you walk around, D would be to your left. Okay, and then we have a, a vector field, F, P, Q. Uh, smooth means there's no cusps, like the first, the first derivative is continuous. Defined everywhere, okay? So then if you have all those conditions, then this is true. And I could do, a, I could, that's a circulation in there. We can make a little circle on that. The circulation integral around C is the same as the double integral over D of QX minus PY. So the first thing I want to tell you about this is that this is another version of the fundamental theorem. This is another uh, fundamental theorem Green's theorem, it's fundamental theorem. So, but this one is a little harder to see than the fundamental theorem of line integrals was like kind of a direct analogy to our original fundamental theorem. So here's our, here's our calc one fundamental theorem. But this one's a little more elusive, but it still has all the same traits. So what do you notice? So the first question is, if we wanna match up sides here, do the left sides match up and the right sides match up? Or would you match across? Looking at this, Green's theorem. Would you match? Do they match up like across, like an X, or do they do they match up left, left, right, right? Left, left. I've heard, I've heard both. What do we think? So I heard most people said uh, left, left, and right, right. I heard one person say cross. Who said cross? What do you think? Why? why? I think it's a cross because um, the top one, the right side is uh, one order lower than the left side. So that one would be on, that one would match up with the left side and the bottom one order lower than the right side. Order of integration. See that? So this is double integral, single integral, no integral, and single integral. So it's talking about like that, the order of um, the magnitude of integration, right? So this is like two integrals and one integral, one integral and no integrals, which would indicate a cross, and that's correct. So let's get a little more detail here. So would we say that in the fundamental theorem, the, the original fundamental theorem, looking down at the left, that's the accumulation of many bits of a quantity, right? We accumulate bit by bit, and that's analogous to this double integral. We're going to accumulate bit by bit over D, over D, right? We're going to accumulate all these little DAs, uh, over all these little DAs. Just like we accumulated bit by bit along some function, some rate function. Okay, of? And each... Uh, we accumulate those quantities. Each is calculated by rate trying to change an in independent. So notice, this is the rate of change of F. And notice, Q, X, P, Y, those are, those are 
This is something of a rate of change, something of a derivative of f, which is pq. And when we do that, what do we get? And that's equal to, now, this, now we're talking about the blue, that's equal to the net change of a quantity associated with the boundary, right? So the boundary is a starting point and ending point, A and B. So there's a net change from A to B, and we can calculate that just as the final value of the quantity minus the initial. So what is that like? If we accumulate every little bits in D, then the boundary of D is C. So it's like we can, so the net change around C is going to be the same as something to do with the accumulation of all the little bits inside D. Okay, and we're going to see two, three more, two more, three more versions of the fundamental theorem, and they're all going to have these characteristics. The accumulations of many bits of a quantity, that's kind of what we think of as the integral or the highest order of integral. And that, that's calculated by rate times the change in the independent variable is equal to the net change of the quantity associated with the boundary. And that's, so that, that statement's true for both Green's theorem and our original fundamental theorem. Okay, any questions on that? So whenever we, we, do, we come to a new fundamental theorem, we always, wanna, we always want to um, see it in this way. Identify, what, what are we accumulating? Where's the rate of change? Where's the boundary? How is it that you know, this accumulation, bits of change using the rate is equal to the net change at the boundary? It's always that. Okay, any questions? Okay, so this slide kind of, uh, it's too fast. Okay, so here's C and D, and we're going to chop it up into little DAs, okay? And so both sides of Green's theorem are this. R, summing up, Little circulation integrals for every dA. There's two, and there's two routes we can take when we do that. So, so both sides of Green's theorem amount to this. Summing up the circulation around the little delta C's within D and summing all of those up. Okay? The first route we can take in doing that calculation is this. We can notice that in adjacent bits... What happens to, so we're going to do the line integral, we're going to add four things together, right? So we're going to do the line integral, we're going to add those four together, and then over here I'm going to add these four together. What happens? What happens if I were to sum up those two little bits, two little circulation integrals around those two things? What's going to happen? Do you see? Yeah. The middle line gets canceled out. You see that gets canceled out? On this, on this one, I'm heading down. And this one, I'm heading up, so that would go away, leaving just what? Leaving the circulation around the outside. You see that? So when you do that across all of D, and you sum up all these little circulations, and all these interior sides get canceled out by adjacent, because you have adjacent line integrals going opposite directions, what are we going to get? Just the line integral around C. Everything doesn't have an adjacent side. So that's that's how this, this idea of summing up circulation of all the little bits ends up being the circulation around the outside. That's the easy part. This takes a little more to really explain. It takes longer. So which, um, I'm love this to and talk through this. But this is kind of the hard side. But anyway. Both of these are equal to summing up the circulation throughout here, and so therefore they're both they're equal to each other, and that's that's kind of the the gist of the proof of Green's theorem. All right, so examples, but 
love to sit down, take 15, 20 minutes, think through this, but we just don't have the best time. All right, so we're going to verify Green's theorem. So what, is, so what does it mean to verify the theorem? So we know what the theorem is. So here's the theorem. What does it mean to verify that? To verify. To show that it's true. What would that what would that mean for solving this problem? To verify theorem. He said solve it both ways and see if they're equal. Yeah, that's what verifying a theorem means. It means you gotta do both, right? It's like two problems in one. You gotta do both, both sides and show that they're equal. So we're gonna our C is a triangle traversed from zero, zero to two zero. So we'll call it like C1, then up to two four. Well, that's C2. And then back down to 0, 0. So there's our region. So that's our C, closed, simple closed curve. Here's D, the region inside. And so what does that mean for doing a line integral? We got to do three line integrals, but they're they're all straight line segments. That makes them easy, especially since two of them are one's horizontal, one's vertical. So we can see one. And so, how do we do a line integral? We need to parameterize the curve. So easiest way to do that would be all y coordinates are along c one zero. And the only thing that matters is the x coordinates, so just call it t. And t will go from what to what then? 0 to 2. dr is? From 0. You guys are experts at line integrals, right? So we're going to integrate from 0 to 2. f is? y, comma 4x, which for this parameterization will be 0, 4t. Is that right? Dot one zero dt. Is that zero? Dot product zero, right? Yeah. Perfect. C two. We'll use S. What's the parameterization of, of C two? All x coordinates are two. Let's use S for Y, and then we'll integrate from what to what? 0 to 4, so we do, uh, this, is, this is 2. DR2 is? Zero. 0, 1, all right. So we're going to integrate from 0 to 4. Now we need Y comma 4X. What is Y? S for X is eight dot zero one which equals let's see this will be eight from zero to four is that thirty two T T D S sorry T S C three R three we use U Okay, so let's use our zero to one technique, right? So if we want u to be zero there and one there, what do we do? Start at two, four, and then add the changes. How much x change do we have? Negative two u. How much y change do we have? Four. Is that right? dr is negative two, negative four. Integral from 0 to 1. Okay, y comma 4x. Four 4x four is going to be 8 minus 8u, is that right? Check my math. Probably. 
What's that? Should that be zero to one? Zero. Here? That's what I wrote. Oh, oh okay. And then minus two. Where am I? Minus four. So this one's a little more complicated. What do we get? Minus eight. Minus 32. Is that minus 40? And 8u and plus 40u. Check my math. I made this parameterization a lot easier by using y equals 2x and going from 2 to 0. y equals 2x would have been more convenient. Have I done the math right so far? Yeah. Great. And then what does this give us? Negative 40 and positive 20. Is it negative 20? Total value of, so the line integral is 12. So line integral around C zero plus 32 minus 20. All right, questions on that. I went fast, but that's hopefully you've had plenty of practice on that. Anybody have a question? All right, so then we're verifying. So what else do we do? Well, this whole thing is Green's theorem. I mean, this is part of Green's theorem. So we're going to do the, the double integral now of d of qx minus py. Hopefully I have enough room here so I don't have to erase everything. So qx minus py, so let's do that first. What is qx minus py? qx is 4 minus 1 is 3. So that's our, that's the, so we're going to do the double integral of 3. And so we're going to brush away the cobwebs here and do our double integral. That wasn't that long ago. How are we going to do the double integral over d? So, does it matter type 1 or type 2? Yeah, let's just do type 1. It's more familiar. And this is the way you know this is line y equals 2x. So, type 1 is what? Bottom to top, left to right. So, bottom to top will be 0 to 2x. And, and those from this first one is at 0, the last one's at x equals 2. And that's going to be dy dx. Is it 12? Yeah. So now I want to, so that verifies Green's theorem. But I want to look at this double integral. Like, any questions? Yeah, please. What's that? So that's referring to the vector field. So this is the vector field PQ, right? The vector field is, according to Green's theorem, is, is our P is the X component of the vector field, Q is the Y component. And then there's our partial derivatives, right? The partial derivative of Q with respect to X minus the partial derivative of P with respect to Y. Other questions about solving that double integral or the line integral? And so Green's theorem verified because 12 equals 12. Now for this, just a side note here, let's look at this double integral. Isn't that three times? The integral of one dy dx? Isn't that what the double integral is? Yeah. So what can we say about that? What is that double integral now? Do you remember? 
That's the area of D because the integrand because the thing we're integrating is one. So this is equal to three times the area of D. That's the area of D. It's a triangle, right? One half base is height is equals. Pretty cool, right? So that double integral, yeah, you could just do it outright as a, as a type 1 or a type 2. Or you could recognize, oh, that's just 3 times the area of the region because it would be 3 times the double integral when the integrand was 1. And that was one thing. We know the double integral is fine. What? What does double integral is fine? <laughs> Net volume, difference of volumes. But we can trick it, right? If we have the, if we have the surface 1, that net that volume from one down to the to the x y plane is the same as the area of the region because the height is one everywhere, right? So we're tricking it to find an area for us. Okay, questions on this example? Okay, another example. Find the circulation line integral. So I want to know what the circulation is if it's the simple closed path shown through the vector field 1, comma x. So I want to know the value of the line integral, which is a circulation integral because it makes a closed loop. So we've got to parameterize the three paths, right? And do three line integrals. Do this. So we're going to do C1, parameterize that little parabola there, parameterize that line, add them all up, right? Double integral of what? So what double integral would it be equal to? What's the region? And what is D? What's that? Inside of C, right? So it's inside of C. Okay, of what? Qx minus Py. Would be one minus zero. Which is equal to what? It's equal to the area of that region. Can we solve it that way? Circle? Y equals x squared? Is that circle? You know, we got a parabola on the edge there. So we, we don't have a quick and easy geometry formula to get this thing because this is parabolic. So we're going to have to do the double integral. So how are we going to do this double integral? Type 2 or type 1? Do type 2 because then we only need one, right? Type 1 will, has two bottoms. So we need two. We didn't need to split it up. So let's do type 2. So type 2 is going to be? dx dy. And x goes from negative y to square root of y. As, and then all those start at y equals 0 up to 1. How about that compared to doing that line integral? It's a lot better. Yeah, it's a lot better. Yeah, it's a lot better. Yeah. The line integral, right, we have to parameterize three curves, do three separate line integrals, and add the values together. Or we can just do this. And so what is this going to be? 0 to 1, square to y, plus y. Is that right? Yeah. 2 thirds y to the 3 halves, plus So 
do the math right. So plus y is minus a minus y, right? And so I think this is uh, plus two thirds plus one half. Seven six. Get one more quick example. So, and so, so what is seven six? Seven six is two different things here. What is what is the value of seven six? It's the area. It's the area of that region. What else is it? It's the line integral, right? It's the it's the circulation, the line integral. Is this a is this a conservative vector field? No. How do you know? Because it's not zero, right? We got we have a closed loop and it's non-zero, so that can't this can't be a conservative vector field. We can also check with Clairaut's theorem. Ask me if I lost you. No, we're we're moving. Ask me, please. All right. So one more. Should be a quick example. So here's the vector field, 5x to the fourth plus y squared, comma, 2yx. And I have a slanted ellipse. It does go through a 1, 0, negative 1, 0, and 0, 0.5, and negative 0, negative 0.5. So that, I guess maybe that would help a little bit. So what are we going to do here? You want to do the line integral around the slanted ellipse x squared plus 3xy plus 4y squared equals 1? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're a brave soul. All right, what about do we want to do the double integral over d? Are we going to do type 1 or type 2? Why? Because qx is? Qx is? 2y, py is, therefore, what's going on here? Yeah, qx equals py, right? If you have qx equals py, then you're doing the double integral of qx minus py, which is 0. So every, and then we know every line, and this, this means... This is 0, too. Why? Because every closed loop in a conservative vector field is 0. So the circulation is 0. Qx equals Py, so our integrand is 0. So Green's theorem in a conservative vector field is kind of trivial. It's just everything is 0. So it's really Green's theorem is really interesting in non-conservative vector fields. It's not really interesting here because you're going to have a closed loop. It's going to be 0 in a conservative vector field, and then that matches up with the fact that by Clairaut's theorem, qx equals py, and your, your integrand will be 0. So Green's theorem really is about, it's interesting in non-conservative vector fields.